theologically, you know, we looked at the legacy of landmines. We looked at what it means when landmines are planted and then left behind, and uh, what it means to leave landmines amongst a civilian population once a conflict ends. Every conflict that I've ever covered, landmines are an issue. It's just a menace that never goes away. You know, Pol Pot always said that a landmine was the perfect soldier. You know, you don't have to feed it, you don't have to pay it, it just lies in wait. There was one thing I didn't realize until then is that landmines is like intoxicate all your daily life. And these people, like they are surrounded by landmine field, but they have no choice because they live there to go through them. I traveled to Laos in early March of 2014 to learn the amount of cluster bombs that were dropped. It was approximately 270 million, and a lot of them never got exploded because there might be a hundred in one casing that's being dropped. So a certain percentage of those is exploded. The rest are unexploded order and still found today. Sajal was probably the strongest images of uh, my Iraq trip as was the saddest and the most miserable face of a human being I've ever seen in my entire career. Sajad was in the field attending his family ship with his three brothers. They stepped on an exploded cluster munition. Sajad lost both of his legs. Two of his brothers got killed. His younger brother suffered from stomach laceration. He couldn't play with, with his fellow kids. I mean, he couldn't go to school, he couldn't go anywhere, he couldn't do anything. And that is the face that I've seen uh, for most of the nights that I wasn't able to sleep after the assignments. And I think that ECRC will be able to give him back that dignity with prosthetics. And this is one of the reasons why projects in Iraq are very important to those people. It was interesting to see how important the prosthetics are for them and how they can transform their lives. I was impressed most. They are working in everything, you know, they are shoot repairs, they are working in the field, you know, agricultural stuff, coffee plantations. The last victim I met was Juan Ramon Lopez, and he, he was a, a combatant during the Nicaraguan Revolution. He started a, a new business uh, looking for gold in the rivers near the mountains. He was making a living for the last seven years and supporting all the, the, the whole family, a big family. And this is what amazed me. Keep working and keep developing ideas to, yeah, to, to survive, you know. When you have that level of poverty, landmines aren't your most pressing issue. AIDS is your most pressing issue, education, agriculture. There's so many other things that are higher up on the totem pole than landmines, yet they remain an ever-present issue that has to be addressed at some point. You know, it comes back to the fact that landmine, you know, detection and the removal of landmines is incredibly labor-intensive. And one thing that I, that I really respected amongst these people who work in this profession is the incredible patience. They move one meter by one meter on their knees. He does that for about 10 hours a day, every day, with an incredible dedication and incredible efforts. I couldn't do that job. I'd have too much attention deficit disorder and I'd get blown up. So I think it takes a very specific person to work in this profession. What I learned from uh, this experience in Iraq is that education is key. Mine awareness education programs spread around the country that will definitely prevent at least children playing around with uh, cluster ammunition and explosive ordnance and landmines. Your average child who's just playing, a cluster munition is the size of a golf ball in most cases a little bit bigger than a golf ball, but it's rusted, it blends in with the, the dead leaves and comes more to the soil, especially during rainy season. Three mothers all agreed to be photographed. I had to say, you know, is it okay? It's so important that I photograph you because we have to tell this story. You lost your son. And I wanted to take them back to where it happened. I think considering that they never had anybody that showed this amount of attention after their sons were killed. I think it was, it, it made them quite emotional. I think they realized that someone actually really cares. One of the landmine victims we met, Zoran, told us that he founded a volleyball league for landmine victims. Once they get their outfit and they go into the court, you feel like they are just themselves again, I guess, like everybody is equal. 
Having seen them playing is a big message of hope for the country because during the time lapse of the match, they all play together. doesn't matter which faction they are from. How can you go back to your house and complain about an headache or something like that once you see that? It's a life lesson, yeah. All these things like maybe, you know, reflect about your own life. Like, uh, okay, you are always complaining about these things or these things. And, but when you meet these people, you say, you have two legs, you have two hands, stop complaining and just do it, you know. The people who got injured in the last decade, they need uh, a rehabilitation, they need social support constantly until, you know, for the rest of their lives. Having covered so many other war zones and conflict areas, to me, it's like you keep on seeing the same things over and over again. What happens after the fact? You know, how many generations? If you laid them, you should be responsible for unlaying them once the conflict is over. The fact that they can lay in the ground for another 30 to 40 years, maiming you know, children, you know, innocent individuals, simply trying to grow food, or walk home, or get to their cattle or goats, that's a dramatic irresponsibility.